Okay. Uh, good afternoon. So <clears throat> this is the second half on, of the course on algebraic topology. So by itself, this is a rather big topic in algebraic geometry, uh, in, in mathematics, but um, we will only kind of look a bit at the surface of it. So we had the first part about uh, the fundamental group and covering spaces, and now I want to talk about, uh, so the second part is uh, about homology. So <clears throat> I've prepared some notes. They are somewhat preliminary, but you can uh, look at them, and they are relatively close also to, uh, to the, this book of Hatcher. Uh, algebraic topology. Um, this would be chapter two, actually rather parts of it. So now I want to start. <coughs> so you will have to get used to my handwriting, but I think it uh, should be okay. <coughs> so um, in topology, one starts somehow topological spaces. So if you want, in some sense, the shapes of, uh, of some spaces. And uh, <clears throat> algebraic topology is about uh, somehow combining this with algebra. So what one wants is, uh, <clears throat> so in algebraic topology, we assign some algebraic data, usually a group, uh, so to a topological space X. Uh, a group F of X. And uh, so then you can use uh, somehow methods of algebra to find out something about X if uh, this group you know, somehow encodes the information about X in a particularly nice way. And um, so this somehow is supposed to help translate uh, questions of topology into questions of algebra. And uh, so you have seen one instance of this is the uh, fundamental group. Um, P1 of x, x, of x with the base point x. <coughs> and this is some group, which somehow tells us about loops in x, in x. So about homo homotopy classes and uh, you have heard a few lectures about this. Now we want to assign different kinds of groups which are the homology groups. So these are just a whole set of groups h n of x, uh, correctly with the h n of x with z coefficients, but we do not consider anything else, um, which are some abelian groups. So these are there for all positive integers. And uh, they are abelian groups. Whereas the Fundamental group obviously can be non abelian. So <clears throat> now, and what we actually will be studying is uh, uh, I will now want to introduce the topic of the study these homology groups. These are the singular homology groups. So, singular homology. So um, now we will find out, I'm not sure whether we'll find out in this lecture, but it 
turns out to be that uh, homology is actually in, in many ways simpler and easier to handle than homotopy groups. But in the beginning, it's considerably more complicated because it needs more technical kind of baggage. So, so single homology is simpler and easier to handle uh, than uh, homotopy groups. And the fundamental group is the first homotopy group. Um, but we need uh, more algebraic background. So we need, for instance, some homological algebra. And as you will see, the definition is also much less intuitive. Uh, you know, for a mathematical group, you just have these loops in X, and you can kind of deal with them for the uh, homotopy, uh, for, for the homology groups. It's uh, somehow uh, a little bit more complicated. We have uh, somehow more technical objects. What? Uh, Simpler. So the question was just uh, easier. easier. Yeah, sorry about the handwriting. <clears throat> so singular homology is simpler and easier to handle than homotopy groups. Um, so, so we start with some simple thing in this homological algebra. We talk about chain complexes. So what is that? So a chain complex so C star D is a, first a sequence so Cn n in Z of abelian groups and some maps between them, which we all call D. And homomorphisms D from Cn to Cn minus 1 for all n. So we have somehow, it looks like this. We have somehow here Cn plus 1, and we have D, and we have C. And we have D again, which is in fact another D. One could call this Dn plus 1, this Dn, but we just write D, Cn minus 1, and so on. And with one property, namely that the composition of D twice is always a zero map, such that D composed with D is equal to zero at every stage. So if uh, here we have another D, so if we first go from here to here, if we use D twice from here to here, this is just a zero map. So the, this, the second D is zero on the image of the first D, and the same is true if one goes on. Okay, this is a chain complex. And if we have a chain complex, we can define its homology, and the singular homology we deal with Yes? I didn't answer this question, uh, this definition. I didn't understand. What is the difference between uh, the D and up D, 2D? What? We define 1D and C in to C in minus 1. And then uh, down 1 is different. Yeah. So, how, how is it different? So, so I. <clears throat> So the question is, uh, what is the difference between the different Ds? Yes. yes. And the, 
reason, uh, I, what I said is that I, by use, use of notation, always give the same letter D to all the different maps. You know, we have the D from Cn to Cn minus 1, so we have an abelian group, and between any two successive ones, we have a map which we call D. We could call it Dn. And then we would have here Dn plus 1, Dn, and we would here have here Dn plus 1, Dn, and this is then true for all n. Okay? But I want from now on always write D, because you, you should be able to, to, to see which D I mean just by seeing from where it starts. The one which I here call Dn is the one which calls it Cn. So if I write D from Cn to Cn minus 1, it's a different D than if I write D from Cn minus 1 to Cn minus 2. I mean, it happens all the time in mathematics that one uses the same notation for different things. In particular, as here they are very closely related, it seems reasonable. Okay? What? Oh, I wrote the other round? Yeah, indeed. This is precisely the reason why I, why I do not write the index, because you, it is only leads to uh, confusion. Okay, so if we have <coughs> such a chain complex, we can define the homology. So the homology of the chain complex, H star of C. Maybe I can just write Hn of C star, which is also, which actually depends on C star and D. Um, this is for all n and z, is defined to be uh, hn is defined as hn of c star d uh, equal to the kernel of, if I write for the moment again, d from Cn to Cn minus 1. And if you want, you can write the n, but you know this is, I don't. Divided by the image of D from Cn minus n plus 1 to Cn. Okay. So why does this make sense? So um, Note that uh, we have that D composed with D is equal to zero. Thus, the image, so if we apply D twice, we get zero. That means the image of the D we apply first, this one, lies in the kernel here. Thus, the image of D from Cn plus 1 to Cn is contained, is a subgroup of the abelian group uh, uh, the kernel of the next D. And you know, a sub, if you have a subgroup of an abelian group, we can take the quotient group, which is again in a abelian group. So Hn of C star D is the quotient group. So at least we can make this definition just for um, later uh, usage. I will always write Zn of C star to be the kernel above, kernel of D from uh, Cn to Cn minus 1, and uh, Bn of C star to be the image of the previous map. This would be called 
elements here are called cycles, n cycles, and elements here are called n boundaries. So uh, the entomology is the quotient of the n cycles of the group of n cycles by the group of n boundaries. So now, so this was for the moment enough of these generalities. Now we come back to uh, defining singular, defining homology, namely singular homology. And this will be done by making some chain complex of which it is the homology. And uh, <clears throat> so in fact, so singular homology is the homology of a chain complex made from maps, from continuous maps, um, say sigma from delta n to x from simplices. Um, to, the to the topological space X. So a simplex, so simplices are, you know, a zero simplex will be a point. An interval will be one simplex. Uh, a triangle is a two simplex, and whatever, a three simplex is a tetraeder. This is not. And so on. So, um, and obviously, if we say this, you know, these are some subspaces some subtopological spaces of Rn, and they carry the you know, subspace topology, and then it makes sense to talk about continuous maps. Um, and so now first, um, I have to say a little bit more about simplices before I can talk about more things, because I need to actually do some things with them. So I want to define them properly and some maps between them. So we have a definition. So if we are given k plus 1 points, in Rn, we can define, we can, uh, so, so I call them maybe P0 to so PK. I can define their convex hull. It's just uh, what one thinks. It's the, you know, if you write down the points, it's just everything between them. Okay. What is this formally? So this is is uh, so this is p zero in these uh, square brackets p zero until p k. This is uh, the set of all linear combinations of these points where the sum of the coefficients is one. So all positive linear combinations. So sum of all some i equals 0 to n ti pi. You know, these are some vectors in Rn, so I can form this linear combination. So these are some points in Rn. 
such that two things hold. First, the ti are all non-zero. And the sum of the ti is equal to 1. And if you think about it, if you do it for these uh, three points, you would precisely find you get uh, all the points in the triangle spanned by these. Or if you have two points like this, this precisely describes the interval. And the uh, same thing. So, <clears throat> okay. Yes? This one goes from 0 to M or 0 to K? To K. To K. So the question was whether <laughs> the sum goes from 0 to K, and obviously it goes to K, as you correctly said, because uh, we only have K. Thank you. So if these points, uh, or rather the difference with the first, say, pk minus p0 until p, well, maybe p1 minus p0 until pk minus p0, if these vectors are linear independent, which precisely means that these points do not lie in a lower dimensional vector space, the, uh, lower than dimension k, uh, then uh, p0 to pk is a k-simplex. So it's called a k-simplex. But we will, <coughs> so as I said, we just have these, for instance, these three points. For them, these, uh, the difference of the with P0, so P1 minus P0 and P2 minus P0 are linearly independent, and we find that this is indeed a two-simplex. Uh, most people will use the standard simplex, which I call delta N, which is the convex hull of some special vectors, E0, until En. And um, so in this case, um, I mean, there are different conventions. I choose this one, E0, is just the origin. E1 is the vector where the first coordinate is 1, the other ones are 0, and then so on. So E2 would be. Um, 0, 1, 0, and until En. Okay. So, <clears throat> in other words, uh, so, <clears throat> and so, and then delta N explicitly can also be written, as you can easily check, as the set of all um, um, S1 to Sn in Rn, such that uh, the Si are all non-negative, and the sum from I equals 1 to N Si is smaller equal to 1. But the <clears throat> I mean, this is because here the first one is 0, so it doesn't count what you take as coefficient for the first one. OK. So in this case, uh, so just as an example, delta 0 will just be Point zero. Delta one will be uh, the interval from zero to one. Zero is E zero, one is E one.
delta 2 will be the triangle in the origin like this, E0, E1, E2, and so on. So these are some very simple things. <clears throat> Um, and so I also want, one can also use these points to define a map from a standard simplex to, uh, to a simplex uh, or to the convex, convex hull of some points. So for points P0 to say PK, in IN, there's a continuous map. Which have been denoted by the same letters with round brackets, P0, PK, from delta K to the linear span of P0 to PK. which sends um, such a linear combination, sum i equals 0 to k, um, ti times ei, so any point in this thing. What? Yeah, which one? What? Yeah, the sum is equal to one. In and they are smaller equal to one. Yes, maybe it's an exercise to understand why. You know, because obviously, you know, the difference is here that e zero is equal to zero, and therefore, equal to one becomes smaller equal to one. There. Okay. But here. <coughs> Um, but you know, note that here we are writing the standard simplex as a linear combination with, where the sum is equal to one of the ti. But the e zero is zero, so that uh, so. <clears throat> and I sent this to the same linear combination uh, of the pi. And you can easily check that this is uh, you know this is basically a linear map. And so, and so certainly it's continuous. So we have a continuous map from, uh, in particular, from the standard K simplex to any K simplex, we have a continuous map, but we, the map is also continuous if these points are not in linear and independent. And we want to use this to define something which will later allow us, huh. anyway, so there's this tiny problem that I introduced quite a lot of notation and uh, then I'm going to use it. But as I don't have so much blackboard, I will also wipe it away. So you should consult also your notes. <coughs> um, so in particular, we have the face map. So which I, uh, the face maps. So fi, which I actually usually don't call fi, but just by what they are, e0, ei, hat, to en. So if I write a hat over an index, over, over such a coefficient, I mean this thing is not there. So this thing has only n components. The ith component is not there. So this is meant to be e0, to e i minus one, e i plus one, e n. Okay, this is relatively standard notation, but once I explain it. So this is a map from delta n minus one to delta n. How does it go? Um, Maybe I write down the map just explicitly, although it is written here. 
uh, you would have to translate it. So if I have a, an element, so I write this out now, if I have an element sum i equals 0 to n minus 1 ti ei, so this is any element in this thing, I send it to the same linear combination of, you know, all until n with the i's excluded. So this will be the sum i equals 0 to i. Ah, I can't call it i because I don't, because I have the i here. Um, from k equals 0 to i minus 1, uh, tk, ek. And then afterwards, I, you know, I've taken this away, so I have to shift by 1. So this is plus sum k equals i to n minus 1, tk, ek plus 1. So that's, uh, you know, what this notation obviously means. <coughs> And notice that the image is, uh, you know, as always, just uh, this thing, the corresponding simplex, convex hull of all except for EI. But, uh, um, but you should notice that this is indeed, you know, in the standard sense, a face of the simplex. So this is the face of um, the simplex E0 to En opposite to the point Ei. So if you make a, I mean, I can just make some pictures to, I mean, if you have a, for instance, if you have the interval here, this would be delta 1, then uh, F0 of delta 1 of uh, uh, delta 0 is, for instance, equal to, you know, we take away the 0, so this is just the point E1. Okay, and if you look at it, this is one of the faces of this thing. So if we have a delta 2, E0, E0, E1, E2, then uh, what is F0 of uh, delta 1? It's, <coughs> uh, what is F1? F C F zero of delta one. Well, this is uh, you know the linear combinations of E one and E two. We talk because we throw away E zero. So this is just the interval E one E two. So the the span of E one and E two. And you can really see this is. And if you try to make a picture of your mind of the next case of tetraeder, you can also say that you always get the face opposite to the, the vertex you have thrown away. OK. So I think this is enough. Now, you will most likely at this point have started asking yourself why I talk to you in such a complicated way about something as simple as simplices. And uh, you know, that is certainly a quite uh, justified question because you know, these things are rather trivial. And uh, we make all these uh, kind of slightly intricate definitions with them. But you know, it doesn't change the fact that the things are still trivial and do not contain anything interesting. But uh, now we want to use them to define our homology and then these things become important. So, as I mentioned at the beginning, the homology, so singular homology, homology of a topological space X is defined. Um, 
using continuous maps. from simply C's, so sigma from delta n to x. So we somehow, you know, if you want, use the simply C's as some kind of uh, probe to find out how x looks like. So we have somehow our thing here, and here we have our x, and we have this map sigma, and it somehow maps it into it. In, it could be in a very complicated way. It's just a continuous map. And we want to somehow understand something about how x looks like by studying these maps. That seems to be <coughs> a crazy thing to do. And um, <coughs> because, you know, as you can imagine, there's an incredible amount of such maps. If, you have a, if this is Rn, you know, you have kind of uncountably many such maps, and they can do just about anything. But if we do homology, we somehow finally get only the interesting information. So let's now look. Definition. Let x be a topological space. Uh, so a singular n simplex. I will usually forget the word singular. Uh, n simplex in X is a continuous map sigma from delta n, so from the standard in n simplex, so really just the simplex in Rn to And now, in order to get something useful out of this, we want to make it first considerably more complicated by not looking not just at these maps, but at formal linear combinations of such maps. So technical word is we look at the free abelian group generated by them, but maybe that will not. Um, so definition so let x be a topological space again so x is still our topological space the singular uh, chain complex c star of x so I hope you still remember that we talked about uh, chain complexes, which were a sequence of abelian groups together with differentials, with these maps d, which always d, if you, if you want to call, call it the n, goes from cn to cn minus 1, and so on. Um, and now we have to, in this particular case, we want to define such a chain complex. So we have to define some abelian groups and some differentials between them. So is defined as follows. So we call Cn of x is the following thing. And we might want to make sure that you understand what it is. So it's the set of all formal sums sum i equals 1 to n a i sigma i, where sigma i from uh, delta n to x is a singular simplex in x, so it's a continuous map. And um, the r a i are some integers, and n is any post or non-negative number. So I don't know whether you are 
familiar with such formal sums. Maybe you could get some <coughs> feedback. So uh, in principle, this is just a shorthand for saying we have a map. So maybe, OK, so, so and I can, uh, so you can see that this is, um, So by, anyway, this is for all n bigger than zero. I will explain a bit more in a moment. And we put Cn of x equal to zero for n smaller than zero. Okay, so we have uh, these, abelian these abelian groups, hopefully we'll see in a moment. Um, Cn of x for all n. For n smaller than 0, they are defined to be 0. For n bigger than or equal to 0, they are somehow defined in this complicated way. Um, so I can write this <coughs> also differently, and then I explain what it means. So equivalently, so write, we write an element of uh, Cn of x as um, sum, so all over all sigma, r sigma times sigma for, so where sigma are the n simplices, so sigma uh, n simplices in x and a sigma in z and only finitely many non-zero. So maybe this notation explains what uh, makes it a bit easier to understand what the meaning of a formal sum is unless you know it already, namely it's just a shorthand for something else. So here, what? sum a sigma times sigma just stands is a is another notation for a map from the singular Simplices in X to uh, to Z. Um, namely, uh, sigma is sent to A sigma, and uh, uh, <coughs> So, and so the end chains, so another word for describing these end chains, so Cn of x is also just the map, the set of all maps from uh, singular simplices in x, singular n simplices. in x to z. Um, with the property that, uh, so if I call such that if f is in cn of x, only finitely many uh, f of sigma are non-zero. So let me try to briefly put this together. I mean, to, I mean, I just want to make sure that you know what such a formal sum is. So in future, I will only use the notation of formal sums, either in this form or in this form. So an end chain is such a formal sum. But if you are not familiar with formal sums, you can view it as some kind of shorthand. Namely, the formal sum is another word for talking about a map 
which associates to every simplex, every sigma, an integer with such a property that only finitely many of these numbers are non-zero. And the correspondence is by sending the map sigma goes to I, A sigma to the formal sum, sum uh, A sigma times sigma. Okay? I mean, it's standard notation. Maybe you are familiar with it, but I wanted to make sure. And from now on, uh, we use it. So we, I have defined to you uh, these sets for the moment. Why are they groups? Um, so, so Cn of x is an abelian group. Namely, in the obvious way, you can add to such formal sum by summing the coefficients, or in the language of uh, functions like, of maps like this, you just sum the maps. What? I don't understand Which one? You don't understand? No, I, I cannot. So this one. So you don't understand the notation in. Uh, so. So I have defined. So. So what's written here is sum a sigma times sigma. So a sigma is an integer. Sigma is an n simplex in x. And what this is supposed to be a formal sum, where only finally many of this a sigma are non-zero. And the this notation can be viewed as a shorthand for the map from the set of all possible sigmas, so the singular n simplex in simplices to z, which associates to sigma, a sigma. So I just write down the same information as this map in, forms, in terms of this formal sum by writing as a coefficient of sigma the thing it is mapped to. In other words, you know, I just have to associate to every sigma a number of which almost all of these numbers are non-zero. It's supposed to be finite formal sum. And that's what this notation says. Is this more or less clear? Um, <clears throat> OK, so I want to say that this is an abelian group. And <clears throat> if you understand the notation, that's fairly obvious. Namely, if I take uh, the sum, I can just define sum sigma a sigma times sigma. Uh, is map plus sum sigma b sigma times sigma, where again only finitely many are non zero, uh, uh, is defined by just adding the coefficients. So this is sum sigma is plus b sigma times sigma. And you can, in the same form, way form the difference, and the zero element is the formal sum where all the coefficients are zero. And here, you know, you can also write it in this form with some finite sum where you only write the terms which are non-zero, where the coefficient is non-zero. And this is saying the same as viewing this as maps. And then you sum the maps, you know, from singular and simple to z just as maps. You use, if you uh, sum the, you know, you have one map to z, another map to z, you take the sum. That amounts to the same. You, know, you, you sum the, uh, the image here. So this corresponds to, just as a remark, this, course, this sum corresponds to, so this plus corresponds to f plus g, so taking the sum of two maps, namely f plus g of sigma is equal to f of sigma plus g of sigma. No? OK. So, but you, if you do not understand this notation, you will have to discuss it uh, later because, you know, obviously, you will, from now on, these chains 
are the main thing that we are talking about. So if, uh, you know, if uh, I mean, before the next lecture, you have to understand this. Otherwise, you will not be able to follow anything at all. So and now, so we have defined. We <clears throat> wanted to define these. Um, um, we were in the process of defining c star of x, comma d, the chain complex. So this consists of some abelian groups, c n of x for all n, which we have defined, and we have to define the d. I mean, at every n, we have to define a map. If you want dn from cn of x to cn minus 1 of x. So we want to define, which I always call d. We want to define this d. So, so we define d from cn of x to cn minus 1 of x, all n, by, uh, in the following way, we use this uh, boundary, uh, these um, face maps. So if we first define it on a simplex. So, you know, a, an element here is a formal linear combination of, uh, of simplices. So we can also just look at the simplex itself and define what the map is for this. So this would correspond to having as a sum just one times sigma and nothing else for one sigma. So we define it like this. So, so we define it on a simplex, uh, sigma from delta n to x in x. So we define it on such a singular simplex as follows. We say d of sigma is equal to sum i equals 0 to n minus 1 to the i of sigma composed with E0, we throw away the ith to En. So we take this face map, which is, you know, which gives us a map from delta n minus 1 to, to delta n. Then we apply sigma, which is a map from delta n. So we have here, we start here with delta n minus 1. We map it by this map to delta n. And then we apply sigma to get to x. And so this is a map from delta n minus 1 to x. So we see that d of sigma is a linear combination of uh, uh, singular n minus 1 simplices. So this is indeed an element in c n minus 1 of x. Okay. So as it should be. And so, for instance, if we have, um, if you just look at, um, so we, we have here, for instance, our, uh, our simplex E0, E1, E2, we map it with sigma to x, and then, so we take the, basically we take the restriction of this to the different sides, I mean, except that we parameterize them with delta n minus 1. So we have here, again, E0, E1. And so we've, we first map this uh, in the all possible different ways on one of the faces of this thing. And then we map it into x. And we take a linear combination of them with these signs. And the signs uh, are obviously there so that we have a hope that we get a chain complex so that d composed with d is equal to 0. And we will now see why that is the case. So I haven't yet finished, though, because I have said it what it is for a simplex. But I should tell you what it is for such you know, formal linear combinations of simplices. And it's obvious how to do it. We just take. The, formal linear, the same formal linear combination uh, of the D of the simplices. So we just define it in general by linearity. So, uh, 
So, uh, so D is the n of x, is the n minus one of x is then defined by is defined by linearity. So, in other words, D of some sigma a sigma times sigma is defined to be sum over all sigma a sigma times d of sigma. And that is certainly makes some sense. I mean, here we have a finite uh, linear combination. So only find too many of the a sigma are not zero. And this will still be here. I and mean, we get a few more if we apply all these, we get n terms for just one before, but if we're finitely many and of, out of each of them we make n, we still have finitely many. Okay. So, um, yeah. So it's a bit, as you see, as I kind of, uh, if you want, promised you, it is a bit complicated. We make things rather complicated before they can become easier again. And now we want to finish making this chain complex, so we have to prove that the composition of D with itself is zero. So lemma. D composed with D. So by which I mean, obviously, we have uh, Cn of x with d, Cn minus 1 of x, and again d to Cn minus 2 of x. So this combination, this is the zero map, is equal to zero. So if we apply d twice, we are supposed to get zero. And this is supposed to, I mean, and somehow, <coughs> This somehow comes from choosing these signs. So let's just try to do it. First, there's one thing that um, uh, maybe uh, that is very easy to check, but maybe you should check it. Um, if we take first, say, E0 to Ej, so Ej we leave out to En, and we compose this with E0 Ei. So this was wrong, En minus 1, Ei to En like this. We take this component composition. So we here first take the map so the j phase of uh, this n minus one simplex, we compose it with. And now we take the with this uh, by mapping this phase as uh, the ith phase into this simplex, and uh, the claim is that this is slightly more complicated than you might have thought. So it is indeed, you know, here we leave out the j, here we leave out the ith. So one would think this is obtained. Uh, so this is obtained by leaving out the j's and the i's. No, this is, so this by itself is a map from delta n minus 2 to delta n. So this is uh, E0, Ei, no, Ej, Ei to En. So we leave out just the j's and the i's. So this, is, as you can see, is a map from the delta n minus 2 to delta n. Um, so if, if it looks like this, so if uh, j is smaller than i. But if it is the other way around, Then we have here Ei, then Ej plus 1 is left out. And if you think of it, it's, it's obvious you know, how the, map, the maps are defined. If you remember the formula I wrote down, you just write it down, you see immediately that this is what happens. 
because somehow doing this means you leave this out and shift everything by once by one. And if you do it here, you shift also the one you have left out by one. So this is if j is bigger or equal to one. Uh, to I. So you can check this. I mean, this is really simple. But <laughs> given this, we can uh, prove this thing. We want to we first prove that d composed with d, if you apply it to a simplex, is zero. Then, by linearity, it will always be zero. No? So. Proof. Uh, so by linearity, so this was defined in this linear way, it is enough to show that d composed with d of sigma is equal to zero for sigma and n simplex. I mean, for completeness, I say what I mean by this, by linearity, it's enough to show, because then if I have a d composed with d of some sigma, a sigma times sigma, you know, d is supposed to be linear. That is, this is just defined by applying the d to this. So this is nothing else than some sigma, a sigma, d composed with d or say d of d of sigma. So I can write like this. Um, and this is zero. So the whole thing is zero. Mm, OK, now let us do the thing. So just so we just compute. So we just apply the definition. Um, this the first one, so it's d of. Um, sum i equals zero to n minus one to the i sigma composed with e zero. We leave out e i, and we go until e n. This is the first application of d. And d is linear, so we can put um, <clears throat> can just apply d to this. And d applied to this just means that we uh, um, <clears throat> OK, so this is, by definition, this is sum i equals 0 to n minus 1 the i uh, sigma composed with, um, and now we are supposed to apply these other phase maps. So e0 e i hat to e n composed with, uh, so So we are supposed to now apply the D to this, which means that we compose with the phase max maps of, of the n minus 1 simplex. So this is E0, E, J, to E n minus 1. So this is a map from delta n minus 2 to delta n minus 1. Then here we get go to delta n, from delta n minus 1 to delta n. Then we apply sigma, and we make this linear combination. And I forgot something. Namely, there was also a sign. Now it's minus 1 to the j times this. So this becomes minus 1 to the i plus j. So this uh, hope the step is clear. And now <coughs> we have to remember what these are. I mean, to leave out this one is 
means leaving out the J. Here we leave out the I. And this, according to what I wrote here, corresponds to this in these two different cases. So we have to also distinguish these two different cases. So this is some I equals 0 to the N minus 1 to the I. Some j smaller than i, which is corresponds to this case, uh, minus one to the j times sigma composed with e zero e j is not there, the i is not there, then we have the n plus the other case here. Some i equals uh, zero to n. Some j bigger equal to i minus one to the j sigma composed with what is it? E zero to the i. Not there. E j plus one. Now, um, okay. Now we can exchange. So we can the last one. We can also write in a different way. Uh, this is the same as uh, some. So this part here the same as sum i equals 0 to n, sum j bigger than i minus 1 to the j minus 1. We have to shift it by 1 so that that becomes j. Sigma composed with e0, ei, ej, en. But now we see that if we exchange i and j, these two are precisely the same sums. So this sum is equal to this sum with one tiny difference. Here we have minus 1 to the j. Here we have minus 1 to the j minus 1. So we have precisely twice the same sum, but with the opposite signs. So thus it follows that d composed with d of sigma is indeed equal to 0. So we find that d is indeed a chain map. So we, so we have that c star of x comma d is a, a chain complex. OK, so this finishes, in some sense, the definition. So um, now we know how, if we have a chain complex, we define its homology. So we have a chain complex, so we define its homology in the usual way. And this will be the singular homology that we will be talking about for the rest of the lectures. Is there a question? So definition. So we have the, the group of n cycles is uh, Zn of x, which is defined to be, the, again, the kernel of d, if you want dn, but for me it's always d from Cn of x. So Cn minus 1 of x. And uh, so this is the cycle, n cycles singular n cycles in x, and bn of x is the image of d from c n plus 1 of x in cn. 
which are called the n boundaries in X. And we know as decomposed with D is zero that Bn of X is a subgroup of Zn of X. And so the, the nth, nth homology group of X is Hn of X equal to Zn of X divided by Bn of X. So we know that Zn of X is an abelian group. Bn of X is a, subgroup, is, an, is a subgroup, so the quotient is an abelian group. So thus we have the, thus we have the homology groups Hn of X for all n in Z. And by definition, the, cy the cycles in negative degree were zero. We have Hn of X is equal to zero for n smaller than zero. And the other ones are the interesting ones. So now I think it, I mean, it does take a while to somehow digest this. Also, it seems fairly crazy to expect that you can get any useful information out of this. So we have these crazy maps from the, uh, from the singular simplices into X, which are just continuous. So there's enormous amount of them. Now we take formal sums of them, so there are even more. And uh, then we do this crazy thing that we define as differential, and we take the homology. Um, so one would normally expect that this is uh, uh, completely impossible to handle. It's huge and so on. But we will find out that in many cases, actually this will be, I mean, in many cases, this will be a finitely generated abelian group because these two things are more or less of the same size. And um, that one can get some nice information from it. I mean, somehow the very vague, vague idea, which you uh, always has to do with the following. So if you have some, uh, I mean, this is just give some kind of vague intuition why this should be of any use. So if we have such a map from delta n to x, and x somehow looks like this and has a hole here, and we would have, so then obviously we cannot map delta this thing in such a way that, you know, so that it has, uh, that it contains the hole. It always has to kind of be on one side. But now assume we look just at the boundary of it, so the, the sides of this thing. So if you know delta n really looks like this, this is so delta 2, we have a map, we have this thing like this. So <clears throat> there's obviously no map from this to this which contains this hole in the middle. There's no continuous map because we have this hole. So, but on the other hand, obviously, if we look at the sides of this thing, you know, there's a map from this side to this, there's a map from this side to this, and there's a map from this side to this. So the side, the, the faces of the triangle can be mapped to it, but not the triangle itself. And so, this means, in some sense, we have a map from, uh, so the faces are, if you just look at this thing, this will be a one cycle in X. And it would be a boundary, namely the boundary of the map of the triangle into this thing, if we could find a map from this into this, which just fills this. But as there is a hole, we cannot fill it. So somehow, therefore, this homology will us tell us something about the holes that our space has. But it's, you know, things are done in a kind of, in this complicated way to somehow get this out. Um, and we cannot directly talk about the holes, but it's all in terms of these maps. But this is somehow the thing. With these maps, the difference between a boundary and a, and a cycle is somehow that, you know, it's a, 
if we have a cycle, there's always some, some kind of thing that, that closes up in some way, maybe in higher dimensions. I mean, that's the intuition. I'm not saying it's true in, in the strict sense. So if we have a cycle, it somehow closes up outside, and it will be a, a boundary if we can fill it up inside x. And if there's a hole, we can't. Okay? So that's the intuition, but you know, the definitions are these, and we work with the definitions, because intuition doesn't work so well for this. Okay, so now let's see whether we can, let me see where I am. Yeah, so the first thing we want to prove is um, something very, uh, we want to prove that this homology is functorial. So that means if we have a, a map between a continuous map between topological spaces, we get a map between the homology groups. And this will allow us to show that we can, for instance, see from the homology whether two spaces are homeomorphic. Okay? So, I want to show, to see, homology. is functorial. Uh, so that means if f from x to y is a continuous map, then uh, we get a morph then we get a homomorphism star, I mean, we get homomorphisms f star from hn of x to hn of y of a being groups. For all n. So we want to define this, <coughs> and we actually just define it uh, by going back to this uh, homological algebra, but saying in general what we do with chain complexes, because we anyway will need that later. So for this, go back to chain complexes. So definition, let C star D, D star D. So I go, I'm even a bit worse than what you complained about before. So we have a chain complex here, the differential I call D. I have another chain complex, the differential I still call D. So these are, we have here, you know, infinitely many different uh, maps which are called D, and another set of infinitely many different maps which are different from these, which are still called D. But it's always, you know, it's just the boundary map in the chain complex. So that means, uh, so <coughs> the chain complexes so a chain map um, F star from C star D to D star D, and I will usually not write the D, is a sequence of homomorphisms maybe now I will actually give them a number Fn from Cn to Dn you know, a chain complex is given by a sequence of abelian groups, Cn, and maps between them, such that all the maps with the Ds commute. So which uh, commute with the Ds, so such. Such that. So if I look at Cn, we have a map to Dn. And we have also the boundary map D to Cn minus 1. 
And here we have our map Fn. And here I have the map Fn minus 1. And this should always commute. So it doesn't matter whether I first apply the D and then the corresponding F or whether I first apply the corresponding F at the different level and then the D. And so you know, we have all these Ds and all these Fs and everything commutes. So, so if F star from C star to D star is a chain map, we can define a map on homology. It induces which I call again by a map F, I again call it F star because you know there are not so many symbols I have. It's induced by F in the same way to so F star from Hn of x to uh, from Hn of C star to Hn of D star for all n in the following way. So if alpha, if alpha is a is an uh, see an n cycle in in C n. So if alpha is in Z n of C star, so this means after all that uh, d alpha is equal to zero. So alpha lies in Cn and d alpha is equal to 0. Then uh, we can define its cohomology class. We call by denote alpha its cohomology class, its homology class, its class uh, in Hn of x. Hn of x, after all, is Zn of, the, of C star. which, as you remember, was uh, Zn of C star divided by Bn of C star. So, so we just define the equivalence class of this element in this quotient. Uh, we put it by this bracket. And now we want to define a map from the homology here to the homology here. And uh, <clears throat> well, we just say we take the class of alpha to the class of F star alpha. So we, by the same bracket, we define uh, this also in, so if we are in D star. So, or, anyway, so, <coughs> so we define this thing F star by F star of alpha. So this means alpha is a class in the N of C star. And we just send it to the class of F star alpha. Now, in order to be able to write down this, we have to know that this f star alpha actually is in Zn, that d of it is 0. Otherwise, we are not even able to write the equivalence class. OK? So um, we have to prove that this is well defined. So this is well defined. The first thing is that f star alpha is in Zn of d star. So that we can do this, and this just follows from the definition, because you know we we use this commutation thing, namely if we have if we take d of f star alpha, 
then you know, we want it to be a cycle. This should be 0. Well, we know that d commutes with f star. So this is f star d alpha. And d alpha is equal to 0. This is f star of 0. OK, so that's not so difficult. And the second one is I want that you know, this depends only on the class of alpha not on alpha itself. You know, we say the image of the class of alpha is the class of f star alpha. So the class of f star alpha should only depend on the class of alpha. So if, um, if the class of alpha is equal to the class of alpha prime, so this means the difference is a boundary. A better is uh, in C n plus 1 of x, uh, then what? Well, if we take f star of alpha prime, what is it? Well, so we write down f star of alpha plus d beta. f star is a homomorphism, so this is f star of alpha plus f star of d beta. And again, f star commutes with d. So this is f star of alpha plus d of um, f star beta. But so, you know, it's d of something. So it's a bound. is an element in dn of d. So it follows that uh, the difference is a boundary, so the homology class is the same, f star alpha. So we see the map is indeed well defined. Ah, so time is essentially up. So let me see whether I can say something sensible. No. Okay. So I think um, I should stop then. It doesn't make sense to now attempt to uh, finish the proof because it takes another 10 minutes or so. But um, now we will kind of in the most obvious way say what the push forward is uh, on. Uh, you know, so if, um, so if you know, f from x to y is a continuous map, we, you know, we know that a singular simplex, you know, sigma, is always a map in X, is a map from delta N to X. So how do we get from this, you know, and the uh, uh, singular change are linear combinations of these. So how do we get the map from such things to corresponding things in Y? Obviously by composing them this with F. So we, we apply the sigma will be, so f star will map sigma to uh, sigma f composed, uh, no, yeah, f composed with sigma. This is now a map from delta n to y. And then one, no, by linearity one exchange, uh, extends this to chains, and uh, then this will give us a chain map on the a singular chain complex, and therefore it will give us a map on homology. But you know, we will do this next time, and then we'll see uh, the consequences. But yeah. What, what is the difference between this application D and the differential uh, in differential form? Uh, well, you know, by itself, you know, they are completely different things. Obviously, because uh, uh, 
because you know one is in analysis and one is here. But indeed, there is some some relation. Um, so it's a rather deep fact that uh, the homology, actually the cohomology, but this is more or less the same, of uh, a manifold can also be computed using differential forms, and uh, you. This gives you some kind of, you get some kind of chain complex out of the differential forms, and the D that you have for differential forms will give you D for this chain complex, and you find out that the homology that you get in this way is the same as the homology we have here. It's a very non-trivial fact, it's a big theorem. Um, and you can also see that there's some formal similarity, because if you look at how the D for uh, the differential forms is defined, um, you kind of, uh, <coughs> you know, the differential forms are, you know, always anti-commuting when you permute them. And so when you write it down, you get all these signs, alternating signs, which precisely lead to the fact that D composed with D will be zero on differential forms. And this is somehow for the same reason as here. So somehow it, it, things are very parallel and very similar. But obviously you are in completely different worlds. But in the end, the results are closely related also. Okay.